All right, thank you, Austin, and thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, we're going to do kind of a deep dive into what we have learned um, over the past year and a half or so of really trying to build out single-page applications and really um, going all in um, on serverless infrastructure and architecture and just seeing how far we can push it. So why should you listen, listen to me at all? Um, why can I speak to this at all? Um, I'm the director of innovation and awesomeness uh, at Trek 10, which means really I get to play with all the fun stuff. Uh, I get to try to look forward into the future and I get to try to figure out how can I take that new cutting edge technology, take off some of those rough edges and apply it to our clients and help them be successful with it, right? Um, so Trek 10, we're an AWS uh, advanced consulting partner. We really excel uh, in taking things in AWS and services and putting them together and coming up with these pretty awesome uh, ways that our clients can use those services to build out true value and utility from those things. So I caught, uh, I learned about the serverless framework, um, brought it to our guys, and I said, hey guys, like, this, is, this is it. Um, my whole job is to figure this stuff out, right? So listen to me, please. Um, but it turned out being this massive success, and I don't think any of us could have quite predicted how big it was. So you're at the serverless meetup, you probably don't need this, right? But it still uses servers as this huge thing that people like to throw around on the internet. But at least to, to me, and when I think about what is serverless, what is this movement, it's something where it's an approach that I can take towards architecture that for any part of that architecture, any given segment, um, I don't have to massively over-provision anything. I don't have to pay thousands of dollars if I'm using dollars worth. And when it comes to scaling, there is a clear path to painlessly scale. I can turn a knob, I can throw money at something, and it just scales. So a lot of the, the use cases of serverless is you know, REST APIs or, or uh, GraphQL or throwing JSON at something and getting JSON back. But it's not just that. It isn't just an API with some functions of service behind it. Right? It's rethinking that architecture. It's looking at what's below the surface of the water in terms of the iceberg and really trying to understand how I can integrate all of those things together. So in terms of serverless, a lot of the use cases we have, like I said, aren't just APIs. It comes down to things like analytical processing and ETL. I can take massive amounts of data, massive amounts, terabytes, throw it at some Lambda functions and use some fan outs, right? Or, or cascading. So a Lambda function calls a Lambda function calls a Lambda function and I can process massive amounts of data in a very ad hoc fashion. That's just one use case. Uh, event streams. So instead of having a system ask another system, um, is this thing ready, or do I need to worry about this thing? Your systems can tell each other when things are ready, right? Uh, an image was just uploaded. Go do, like, here's this information, do what you want with it. Um, in terms of infrastructure and security, uh, an instance changes, a security group changes, your networking changes, you can react to that event um, and say, whoa, no, that was not supposed to have that tag removed. That instance definitely should not have been turned off. Uh, that security group should not have just opened port 22 to the world. That was bad, right? And then even to state machines and workflows. You can have these complex workflows broken down into this idea of events. And you just have an event to an event to an event, and you don't have to worry about necessarily all of this complex um, uh, interaction instead of just worrying about some events. And then IoT is a pretty new and pretty exciting space for serverless. Uh, things like reacting to um, state changes on a device. Uh, for instance, the threshold of water in, in your basement has exceeded zero and you should probably go look at it. Um, reacting to that event from the state change on the device instead of having to either pull out to that um, or, or things like that. And then there's actually really exciting innovation in this, uh, specific to AWS for us, is things like deploying Lambda out on the edge to a device, and your devices can locally run Lambda and respond to events in the local network instead of just having it go up to the cloud. So if you lose connectivity, you can still have a, a finite deployment model out to your devices. So that's just some of the use cases. There's so many more, and we're finding new ones every day. Um, and we'll go over some of those. Now, I know I, you're probably saying, Jared, you said this is about single page applications. What are you talking about, all this other stuff, right? So it turns out that 
The first time we're like, oh yeah, single page application, REST API, woo, we're done, right? No, uh, there's actually like databases, uh, APIs, background jobs, cron jobs, static file serving, logging, all this search index. It's not just an API. So there's all this complexity behind it. And so what I'd like to do tonight, yes, we're going to talk a little bit about single page apps and some fun stuff there, but also how do we get to the core of that and look at behind just the API? Right, so a single page application, if we go back to the basics, right, I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. It's pretty easy. You have some kind of object store, some simple static file server. Tried and true, you have a CDN, you go to the CDN, you get your static uh, CSS, HTML index, you get all that stuff back, fine and dandy. Right, you can even use some more advanced stuff, like if somebody goes to a pass, a specific path in the URL, you can redirect to a hash URL, and it still all works in your index, uh, in your single page application. And then you have an API gateway, right? Your API gateway is that REST API, GraphQL, JSON API, whatever, I don't care, right? Your single page application communicates with that, sends, sends requests, gets, gets its response, things are good to go. With AWS specific APIs, you can proxy to AWS services, DynamoDB may be behind it if you want direct API access to it, or you can even map to legacy services so you can have people access all of your different APIs through one API gateway. That's great. But let's talk more about API gateway. It's not just JSON or XML or uh, GraphQL or anything like that, right? You can send almost anything you want through API gateway. At this point, you can actually do binary, um, and get binary back, all sorts of exciting things. They even have some functionality where you can directly proxy through to something like Lambda. So what this means is you can define headers and things like that. So essentially, you can set cookies, you can define content types, you can uh, look at auth headers, all that good stuff, right? So it's not just JSON or XML across the wire. It's not just bits and bytes. I mean, it is, it is just bits and bytes. You can look at it as just bits and bytes, sorry. Which means that, since it's just bits and bytes, HTML, right? Which means you can run a whole bunch of really, really little and unlimited servers, which can facilitate serving back uh, dynamic HTML, right? So when I finally realized this, I was really excited because it means I can do some really, really cool things in the serverless world, right? I can serve back HTML. So I can bring my legacy applications that are running Express.js or Django or anything like that, anything that has a reported runtime, um, I can bring that framework in and just serve back HTML. Or, or if you're really cool, we're in San Francisco, we're all really cool, right? I'm from DC, so yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, you can use React.js or Vue.js and you can take that and do isomorphic rendering. So there's lots of other, pro there's lots of projects out there that you can say, take this HTML, uh, take, this, take this JavaScript, throw my request at it, and actually render HTML. So my single page application, while it can be served through uh, your static means, you can also set it up so that on uh, the routes, on the dynamic routing, we can actually go and isomorphically render it um, in place and serve back HTML through our API which means it's great for SEO. Our first page load performance is super improved, and you can appease the like three people in the NoScript crowd. Um, it's insanely scalable like you would expect from serverless, right? So what's this actually look like? Um, we can look really quick. We worked on an application for a client, and they said, they came to us and said, hey, we just want like serverless. We've heard about that. We're gonna use some React.js, and we just, we don't wanna pay a whole lot of money. We just want this somewhat performant, fast uh, uh, website, right? So we're looking at this. Um, so we have, it, it's got some React.js front end going on. You can navigate through, you'll see we have uh, search and all sorts of stuff like that going on. You can go here, uh, see a post, right? All right, so what if I send a link to somebody and they don't have JavaScript enabled for whatever reason, right? I'll go up here and you can see, I'm gonna turn off JavaScript and You'll see the video doesn't load anymore. Our auth isn't uh, dynamic. It's powered through JavaScript. But if I refresh the page, we still get all of our normal uh, working HTML just without JavaScript, right? It's turned off. I can still go get all of this stuff, right? So this, this is apparently really hard to do because a little place called Facebook 
uh, if you go look, they, they just tell you don't do this, <laughs> right? So as far as I'm concerned, uh, it's pretty easy with serverless. Um, so we jump back. Um, so just a quick brief overview of that architecture. Essentially, we just have a user request something. We can put a web application firewall in front of it. We can cut off uh, DDoS attacks pretty quickly with that. Um, through a, through a CDN, and we route to one Lambda function if it's asking for a path that's not our API. And we just have the Lambda function just pulls out data from Dynamo database and returns back HTML after running it through the rendering engine. Um, or if it goes another way, maybe it's actually an API request and we route it that way. Um, and then even more interesting, uh, in my view, is how do you handle user uploads? Like everything has user uploads, right? you can actually upload straight to S3 in a lot of cases and then respond off of that. We're going to look at something really cool there later. But the whole, the whole point is that entire application runs without a single server anywhere in sight for, for quite cheap. Right? So show us the data. How does this actually work? What's the performance look like? So there's something I didn't tell you. Um, that service was actually running from Tokyo. Uh, so it was fairly fast and efficient here in San Francisco even um, to the point that we didn't spend any time thinking at all about optimization of like requests or, or even caching express templates or caching um, uh, view templates or anything like that. We just kind of threw this up and tested this uh, on day one. And if you were to run this in Tokyo, the average response time is 53 milliseconds. Um, the fastest is about 30 milliseconds, right? So you can get these tremendous performance gains by just shoving some stuff in Lambda and um, let it run. Um, just open it wide up, right? We were doing 171 requests a second, and that's just because I didn't test it any faster, because I just said, yeah, it, it'll work. Um, more interesting is that in terms of compute cost, it's actually an order of magnitude more expensive just to pay AWS for the bandwidth than it is for the compute cost, which is Ridiculous. That's a, an amazing optimization if you think about it. You're paying to get people content, not to generate any kind of content. So what have we learned? What kind of rocks did we end up pushing uphill that I don't want you guys to have to do? Um, the first thing is embrace services. Just not servers, please. Services, right? So evaluate the, the opportunity cost of building anything in-house. This applies to anything. but especially with serverless, there's a lot of options out there for things like auth or search or databases or, or media management. Basically, anything that's really hard, someone's probably already tried to solve. Even if they haven't solved it, they're probably farther along than you are at it. That said, don't underestimate using serverless and rethinking things in the serverless paradigm. Right? So what do I mean by that? Well, you can actually build an on-demand CDN uh, fronted image resizer in less than 50 lines of code in a couple hours, right? So what do you mean uh, image resizer, right? So let's go look at this quick. Uh, this is an image from the, the application we were working on. And if you look right here, I'll go into the URL and I'll switch it to like 500 by 500 from the uh, original size. Boom, done, right? Now, I'm lying to you a little bit here because this is actually a cached image. I knew that 500 by 500 had already been generated. But the clever part is I only have to ever generate an image once for any requested size, right? So if I ask for 123 by uh, 234, for instance, I can go, it's going to take a little bit longer. It's doing some magic behind the scenes, but I'm done. If I ever have to ask for that image again, it's already been generated. It's already there. So yeah, don't underestimate it. And just to prove it, like this is the only code side, I totally promise. This is the only code, copy pasted, I promise you, that is behind that service. Right? All of that I got was just this little bit of code, less than 50 lines. So you can really rethink some, some paradigms based on some lever leveraging some services, some smart code, and you can get a long way. And this isn't even like minified or anything. This is just readable code. Just to see how that actually works, right? It's just a user requests an image from the, the CDN. It checks the source, says, no, it's not here. It redirects the user through an API. 
a Lambda function grabs the original, resizes it, puts it back, and then says, all right, go check again. That's it, image resizing, just like that. So what really has worked well for us? Uh, GraphQL and serverless and single page applications uh, make me really happy, and they mean I get to sleep at night. Uh, a lot of our uh, Trek 10's business model is also supporting and 24-7 response. I've never had to wake up for a serverless infrastructure. That makes me really, really happy, right? Image resizing has worked really well. Um, event streams. So once you get really into this, there's things like event streams off uh, NoSQL tables like Dynamo or things like that. And those are really smart to use for things like throttling and synchronization, right? Maybe you want to uh, go from your serverless infrastructure to legacy infrastructure. Uh, a serverless infrastructure could kill an RDS database without even trying. So you might use an event queue to throttle and actually bridge that gap. Um, and things like synchronization to a search index or things like that. Uh, Real-time notifications, there's a bunch of services out there that do web sockets, right? You can actually, to some extent, um, use real-time notifications through web sockets from some kind of uh, pub sub service, AWS IoT, for example. Um, it works quite well. Lambda functions don't natively have web sockets, so you have to have some kind of service in front of it, but it can work. What didn't work? Uh, things like CloudWatch logs. Uh, are, are pretty uh, suboptimal if you actually need to find anything in them. You can use Elasticsearch or all that kind of thing, but you need something real for analysis. Uh, images directly back through API Gateway, just don't try it. Uh, I have like three different support tickets with AWS about this. It just, you can kind of do it, but they don't set headers correctly and it doesn't work in a browser. Um, building locally and pushing. If you're doing anything that requires native bindings, just don't even try to do it locally. It'll just blow up and you'll spend more time than it's worth. Just do a CI builder in uh, EC2 Amazon Linux or an Amazon Linux uh, Docker image. And DynamoDB, I brought this up a couple times, but anything really in your infrastructure that uh, needs to scale to some extent. Uh, you might have provision capacity um, or something like that. You need to tune it up. You should just make sure you have some kind of monitoring around it and maybe even auto-scaling it if you can. Um, and then finally, serverless doesn't mean ops list, no ops or whatever you want. Uh, you can't just throw something out there and celebrate. There's still issues coming. They're just really well hidden by serverless. Um, and you won't find them until it's a really, really big problem. Right? So we've learned that latency is a great predictor that something could be going wrong if something's slowly creeping up. Just have some threshold monitoring and look at that and say, OK, yeah, there's probably something here. So monitor latency, invocation, and error counts, execution time, and even throttling. And that's really the core tenets of serverless, is just be careful about it. Monitor your, your latencies, and just be ready to tune things up. Because if you did it right, it's just a little bit of knob tweaking, and you should be able to scale up. So thanks. It was great to talk to all of you. And I really appreciate you coming out tonight. Looking forward to hearing more from the next talkers. <laughs>